Well, today we're going to take a look at the Maxun Z370 gaming motherboard. This Maxun, wait, wait, Maxun? I've never, never heard of that brand. Or, uh, depending on where you are, you have heard of Maxun. Maxun is actually a huge uh, Chinese company. They OEM for a lot of different companies. In fact, if you look really closely at the Z370 gaming board layout, you may notice certain similarities with this board layout, such as with the MSI Z270 gaming m7 mm. so is that is that you know something untoward going on something 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 i don't know no not really and actually the devil's in the details in fact the whole theme of this review could be the devil is in the details with this particular motherboard and the particular features that it has it's it's a solid motherboard don't get me wrong 14 phase vrm 14 phase vrm on a z370 5 gigahertz on the 8700K, no problem. But the devil is in the details. Let's take a look. So if you look at the motherboard specifications online, it's pretty bog standard. Well, not really bog standard. Bog standard maybe for an upper end Z370 motherboard. 3M.2, three PCI Express by 16 slots, uh, a lot of other, you know, integrated peripherals and options and things like that. But then when you start to look a little closer, it's like just because it's armored reinforced slots doesn't mean it's the same armored reinforced slots. These armored slots appear to be standard PCI Express, like the plastic kind, but with just a metal shroud over it. I know that other slots, such as from uh, Asus and MSI, they actually mold the metal reinforcement in with the actual plastic. These particular shielded slots are not that way. Is this good enough for a heavy graphics card? Mm, probably, maybe. I mean, this is actually soldered into the motherboard, so you know this solution is probably not quite as strong mechanically, but it is definitely stronger than a standard plastic PCI Express slot. Then the other thing I started to look into was, what's the PCI Express layout? We've got three by 16 slots. I would think that you would have by 16 to the CPU or by eight by eight, and by four, but that's not actually the case. In order to save on costs, this motherboard has this slot, the primary slot by 16, wired directly into the CPU. There is no by eight option. There is no other slot option for sending these lanes to the CPU. This slot is PCI Express by four through the chipset, and this slot, even though it is physically by 16, is only PCI Express by one to the chipset. So this motherboard will support Crossfire on the AMD side of things. It will not support SLI because you don't have that by eight by eight connection directly to the CPU. Same with three M.2s. One of the M.2s is the short length, which is appropriate for a wireless card and the PCI Express lane connectivity to boot. The other two M.2, however, are fully functional, also through the chipset, Optane ready and all that. I can find no fault with uh, any of that. The other real headline feature for this motherboard is RGB. You've got RGB RAM, you've got RGB on both of the VRM heat sinks, and you've got VRM on the chipset Northridge. You've also got the standard four pin RGB header. And then we'll take a look at this, but this is something Maxun calls uh, freestyle, freestyle RGB. So uh, if you're not familiar with the eighth generation Core i5, Core i7 CPUs, they're six cores, Coffee Lake, uh, they're overclockable, at least the K-series parts. They use a lot of power. If you look at them on paper, it says 65 watts or 95 watts. 95 watts on the overclockable part, 65 on the non-overclockable. But for overclockers, it's not unusual to dump 200 watts into those CPUs, and you need the VRM to do it. The VRM on this motherboard actually seems pretty competent. I would have liked to have seen uh, perhaps better heat sinks. But as long as you've got an active cooling solution on this motherboard, I don't think that it'll ever be an issue. It does seem to use high quality chokes and caps. By far, the VRM on this motherboard is the best feature about it. Uh, I'm not really sure what the cost is for this motherboard in comparison to uh, other motherboards, you know, other competing brand motherboards, de depending on what region you're in. I would just be cognizant of the limitations, you know, by 16, you're not gonna run by eight by eight. Uh, the PCI Express by four connections are through the chipset. If you're not gonna run a lot of peripherals, these things don't really matter for you. If you're just gonna be overclocking and you wanna run RGB, then this is a perfectly suitable Z370 motherboard. That said, in terms of other connectivity, let's take a look at the rear IO. At the back, you've got a combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port. You've got two USB 2.0 ports. You've got DVI display port and HDMI through the iGPU. We've got mounting locations for a two x two wireless solution that'll go in this top 
M.2 above the PCI Express by 16 connector. We've got uh, USB 3.1, Type A and Type C, another USB 3.1 Gen 1, a pair of connectors below the Intel i219V. And then for the audio solution, it is a Realtek ALC1220 based codec, but this is Max Sun's own implementation. There is a digital SPDIF out header here, but there's no optical connection or anything like that for the uh, audio. The audio is carried on a separate part of the PCB or an isolated part of the P PCB. I can see that, but beyond that, I'm not really sure your, your audio mileage may vary. At the top edge of the motherboard, we've got our eight pin CPU power connector. We've got two four pin fan headers, power reset and LED control uh, for the physical dedicated buttons in the, the uh, top right of the motherboard. We've got our 24 pin ATX power connector, our front panel USB 3.0, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol. Six, so six gigabit per second SATA connections. We've got our chokes and VRMs in the corner here. Another four pin fan header. Uh, our front panel connector, our digital LED diagnostic readout. A clear CMOS button. Uh, we've got our four pin RGB header where we can do the freestyle RGB. We've got two more USB 2.0 connections, an RS-232 serial, two more four pin fan and a, an SPDIF. Uh, now the four pin fan headers, it is, you know, you can run three or four pin. I couldn't get DC control to work on the motherboard. I think it's PWM only on these fan headers. I've sent an email off to Max Sun to verify, but I believe that all of the fan connectors on this motherboard are suitable only for four pin fans. If you're gonna be running a three pin fan, well, you'll need to upgrade or that three pin fan is gonna run uh, at a fixed RPM pretty much all the time. Now, right off the bat for the VRM implementation impression, I'm seeing some things that I like. Now, this aluminum will act as a thermal mass, which will help dissipate heat for transient load, but for consistent load, there's not really a lot of surface area to dissipate heat. And so I would say that you probably need a good air cooling in your case if you're gonna do an extreme overclock on a uh, Z370, but that's offset somewhat by the fact that this is a 14 phase, yeah, yeah I'm 14 phase is serious business on the Z370 chipset. So this is set up for overclocking. Like this is, <laughs> this motherboard put all of its points into overclocking and it does overclock really well. I mean, I don't have a super amazing Coffee Lake CPU, but I can get five gigahertz and it also doesn't run super hot. So for me, for the voltage that I have to run at, which I think it's like 1.31 1 or something like that, then the CPU doesn't really run super insanely hot and neither does the VRM solution. The other thing I like about this is that the thermal pad is appropriate. Looks like there's good contact with those components and the retention for those heat sinks are spring-based. On some other boards you see just, you know, screws screwed in with a little bit of plastic and that really doesn't sort of even out the pressure because it's very important that the heat sink apply even pressure to the surface mount components. And if you just, you know, if you don't have this sort of spring mechanism, you're, you're not always gonna get that. So this is nice. This is a good sort of appropriate setup for this VRM solution. So what are our findings regarding the VRM situation? Well, it's an Intercell ISL 69138. This is a digital dual output seven phase configurable PWM controller. Seven plus zero seems to be how they've got it set up. So to get from seven to 14 phases, each phase has a phase doubler. That is the ISL 6596. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a high frequency MOSFET driver optimized to drive two in-channel power MOSFETs in a synchronous buck converter topology. So that just leaves the MOSFETs. What does it use for the FETs? Boba FETs? Sorry, couldn't help myself. So the MagnaChip single in-channel trench MOSFET, 30 volt, 47.6 amps, maximum nine mega ohm resistance. These MOSFETs, uh, have a maximum load depending on temperature. And so the data sheet provides some handy figures depending on what the ambient and case temperature is. So we're looking at 47.6 amps if the case temperature is 25 degrees C, or if the temperature of the case is 70 degrees C, then it's gonna be more like 38 amps. So uh, it's a little bit more problematic. If your ambient case temperature is 70 degrees C, you've probably got a lot of other problems but if your ambient case temperature is 70 degrees C, you can only push about 15 amps through these MOSFETs. So like most electronics, uh, heat is the enemy and heat will shorten the lifetime of the electronics. And the amount of current that you can push through these MOSFETs depends on how cool you can keep them. And so these work pretty well in terms of a thermal mass for handling spikes and, and short lived things. But if you're gonna have a CPU that is under continuous load, like a grueling, terribleness, then you'll probably want active airflow over the whole VRM regulation area. 
keep in mind that that's still offset by the fact that you've got 14 phases, which is kind of a lot for a Z370 to work with. So the load is a little bit more distributed among those 14 phases in terms of power delivery to the CPU. So you've got that going for you. If you just want me to give you the quick and dirty summary with the power regulation scenario, I think I already have. The motherboard designers put all the points on this motherboard into the VRM circuitry. So it's kind of an overclocking beast. Um, there are, you know, comparable implementations on other boards. And there are other boards that have more features than that. But in terms of, I want to overclock my Z370 CPU to the max, this board is probably worth a look, especially if you're not planning to run a lot of peripherals other than, you know, a graphics card and, and, and maybe an NVMe or maybe, you know, SATA SSDs or, or something ordinary like that. I think this would, this would probably work out pretty well. You've also got the freestyle RGB, so you can do whatever you want in terms of an RGB layout. Now, in terms of Linux testing, uh, with this motherboard, it has the IO MMU groups uh, pretty well broken up for the different peripherals. But because you don't have that by eight by eight configuration, I'm not gonna recommend this motherboard if you want to use VFIO. That said, all of the other peripherals work fine. So if you're looking to build a Linux workstation, this motherboard would be fine for that. You got the Intel i219V, which is really an ideal situation. You get the PCI Express graphics, you know, running dual graphics cards, even in Crossfire. Wouldn't really recommend it because of the chipset connection and, and bottlenecking, but for uh, a Linux workstation where you've got some overclockability, some overclockability in a UEFI, you're looking pretty good. Because Max Sun's kind of a new brand for me, I sort of wanted to sleuth around and see because one of the big things that I look for in a motherboard vendor is how often they update their UEFI. And Intel's moving really fast. At the beginning of 2017, we had Z270. Before 2017 was even done, we had Z370 and a whole new generation of incompatible CPUs. Intel moves really quickly. There's also the Spectre and Meltdown bugs where uh, motherboard vendors are gonna have to update their motherboards to support the mitigations for those security issues. And so I looked through Max Sun's uh, other model motherboards. And I did see some motherboards that have recent UEFI updates, but not all of their motherboards have recent UEFI updates. Uh, I did see some complaints on the forums where people were looking for updated UEFIs for some of their boards. And I think this is maybe just growing pains. I think Max Sun is used to being a huge Chinese OEM. They have a lot of experience making electronics. Their engineers are obviously very talented. I mean, they can come up with this, reference designs for everything else. But the retail market and the consumer market is a little different. What consumers are looking for and system builders and things like that is maybe a little different than what some of their OEM partners are looking for. Overall, it's a pretty solid motherboard. If you bear in mind the, the little asterisks and the little exceptions that we talked about, it is pretty solid. I mean, Z370, it's got a pretty decent feature set. I kind of like it. I'm gonna leave this in a system for a few months doing torture testing. And so this is something we can revisit and see how it goes. I like this motherboard overall. If it holds up, it's pretty stable over time, doesn't crash or do anything weird. I think I'll have found a new brand that I can keep an eye on for future motherboard releases, maybe other sockets, uh, and CPU types and that sort of thing. If you're in the Asia Pacific region and you've picked up some Z370 gaming motherboards or iCraft motherboards from Max Sun and you wanna share your experiences, please do in the forums at Level One Techs. Love to hear from you. Love to you know, show off pictures of your rig or whatever. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.